So do you enjoy the content here on Thoughtful Faith? If so, be sure to hit the notification bell. This ensures that our new videos show up on your feed. Also, be sure to check out our Facebook group called Thoughtful Saints, where myself and others discuss the sorts of topics found on this channel. And lastly, if you think other people would benefit from this video, please be sure to share it. Hey guys, so before we get into today's video, I wanted to recommend everyone check out the Saints Unscripted Faith and Belief videos. These videos do an excellent job of breaking down the controversial topics many church members struggle with or don't understand. David Snell is a legend. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode. Today we're going to talk about the relationship between the Latter-day Saint Temple Endowment and Freemasonry. We've got no time to- All right, polygamy episode. We're talking about some rather controversial issues having to do with race in the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The content is great, faithful, detailed, and perfect for anyone who works with youth in the church. It's important that we discuss the hard issues in the church, and David's videos on Saints Unscripted are a great resource. So go to YouTube and search for Saints Unscripted, and then check out their Faith and Beliefs videos. You won't regret it. There's a part of me that thinks that, um, like, what do we do if somebody receives a revelation and it's maybe not completely in harmony with what the church is saying? And and and, and the church leaders could just be wrong. Like, maybe yeah, you, yeah. maybe God speaking to you about the way things. Like, if you were in nineteen, you know, sixty five, and you felt like black should have the priesthood, um, yeah, yeah. maybe it is that that you were right and that they were wrong. So it's like. The brethren don't always get it right. So that also implies that there's a possibility that you get it right. Exactly. Like, it that makes me think of my friend, you know who Jim Bennett is? Yeah. Uh, the guy wrote a response to CS letter. He shared with me, we just did an interview. Uh, it's going to be aired in the next couple of weeks. It was a really great interview where we talked about a lot of the issues with the, the CS letter and his response. But he talked about in 2015 that when the church brought the policy on the children of LGBT parents, couldn't be baptized or confirmed, I think blessed as well, into the church. You know, it, it created quite the, the stir. And he felt his own personal authority, how he felt morally, his understanding of what the scriptures say, you know, men will be punished for their own sins, you know, not for the sins mm -hmm. of their parents. You know, Jesus doesn't deny children to come unto him. His personal authority told him the church is wrong here. And he felt he sort of said it publicly he felt like the church was in the wrong uh -huh. and he felt very close to having to leave the church but he, you know he shared with me he had a divine personal revelation that kept him in but whenever he spoke publicly people they sort of reprimanded him for it they said like just leave the church like you mm -hmm. can't be talking against the prophet seers and revelators and i was on my mission whenever the policy came into force and mm -hmm. i actually talked with somebody who had an issue with it and because I was very orthodox, I was like, well, it came from the prophets. They're mm -hmm. the mouthpiece of God. It's, you know, if you have a problem with the policy, that's you, you know. And then mm -hmm. we know three and a half, three and a half years later, they they changed the policy back. Um, some people might say, well, maybe it was a revelation to change it back. Uh, but, you know, Jim Bennett would see it as his personal authority was right. And the prophets, seers and revelators. Wrong. So, so an interesting uh, take on that. Well, first of all, personal authority. I don't like the term, and this is why I why I mean it. Just say personal revelation. That's yeah. ultimately what we're, what we're talking about. Like, I find it kind of unusual that 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 Julie and and other people that this this kind of term. The the, the bottom line is is that what we're talking about is that people will say God told me something different than He told the prophets, right? Yeah, that's the essence of it. Right. So she defines it as she is personal revelation plus agency. Yeah, but agency is like freedom. what? What's the active ingredient in this? If God tells you something, you do it. You know what I mean? Like, if if God showed up to me right now and told me like, "Hey, you need to go and join the Methodists," I'd be like, "All right, I'm going to go join the Methodists." You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like the ultimate authority is God, right? Yes, I agree. 
So in this whole conversation, I think it's important that it gets framed properly. I actually did an entire debate with the Calvinists at, um, at Apologia Church on the question of ultimate authority. What is yeah. the ultimate authority? And we all know what their answer is. The Bible. The Bible. Yeah. And is the sole infallible rule of faith, right? And yeah. I was arguing against that. But hold on a second. Think about this. The Bible is just the words of the prophets. They're making the same claim as those who would say the prophet of the church today is the ultimate authority on everything, you know, sole infallible man who yeah. now obviously we don't say he's infallible, but functionally people will treat him as though he is, right? So so there is this it's a little bit nuanced here, but essentially it's an appeal to an ecclesiastical priesthood authority as the final word, yeah. right? Now, final word on what? Final word on what is true, okay? Now, I make a distinction here, okay? I don't believe that the prophets, seers, and revelators of our church are the final arbiters of what is true, okay? Because they are fallible they can't be. They can be a reliable source of truth, okay? But that does not mean that they are always that they always get it right. However, right. I think there is something to be said for ecclesiastical authority so that we don't have the problem of Protestantism, which is right. that we all make up our own thing. And as soon as you disagree with whatever authority you, you have, your pastor, you go start your own congregation and before you know it, you have 50 million churches. There's a reason that the Catholic Church has actually held together for over 2,000 years, spanning empires and politics and wars and all of it. And it is because they have a centralized authority structure. Yeah. And so I never want to underplay the need for ecclesiastical authority. Okay. Yeah. It kind of makes me think of Brother Corbett's talk, which is. There's been, a, you've done videos on it, you know, activism towards or against the church. Ultimately, it can undermine, it, you know, people are criticizing church leaders or advocating against, you know, the church's position on things. It can undermine their credibility to people, which will then weaken their faith in them, you know, and their, you know, authority yep. as prophets, and then can ultimately cause them to leave the church. So it's the whole debate is, is it right to, advocate against them even if they are in the wrong and what if you have truth and rights so you know? this is this is the other thing people don't realize they haven't studied church history they don't know that this has already been something that the church has faced in the past i'm i'm right now reading um three different biographies of well two biographies on brigham young and then the saints volume two and i'm reading them as i go through church history um, in kind of this big project and our history is so freaking awesome. Just everybody. Yeah. It, it, it's it's amazing. <laughs> anyway, in the 1860s, about 1868 or nine, I can't remember when, um, there was a movement called the Godbyites, a guy named William Godby, who actually was a British convert. Um, very, very faithful Latter-day Saint and several other very faithful, active, you know, engaged Latter-day Saint leaders started to kind of have some doubts and some issues with Brigham Young's policies. And frankly, rightfully so. Oh, rightly so. <laughs> there are some things that Brigham was doing that were a little bit, uh, a little wild. Now, yeah. now, granted, I think that there's a complex conversation we had about, about that, but um, I'm just going to read a little bit from this book. It's um, Brigham Young, American Moses. It's the really famous biography on him by Leonard Arrington, which everyone uh, should yeah. read, by the way. I have not read it. I'll need to read it. He says, um, one of these guys that were with Godby, his name was Harrison, said, Harrison said he believed in the priesthood control of policy, but not the infallibility of the priesthood. He said, quote, I do not believe in according to them, the first presidency, the right to dictate me into the course, which I consider wrong, morally wrong. So it's like, that's like, yeah, Jim Bennett right there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like here, here he is and he, and this guy has a legitimate thing. And and I think what's wrong with that argument? Like if you think that something is wrong and the church leaders want you to do it, like, do you just go with the church leaders? Um, like find obedience to their authority, you know, not listening to your own 
moral personal revelation. Yeah, yeah. The things that you feel like you're getting from God. Absolutely. I mean, this is, this isn't a new thing guys. Yeah. Like this isn't the new divide in the church. It's like, this is a very old problem. It's the problem of the ecclesiastical authority and infallibility. And, and, and that goes for the, for authority within the scriptures, even within the Protestant conversation, um, yeah. as to, you know, it, are the scriptures infallible and do we have to, you know, can we recognize that maybe some of the things in the scriptures weren't right? And, and, and when you open up this window of infallibility, it creates all this problem because now you don't have an infallible source of truth. And, and people who grew up with black and white thinking like I did. So I would have thought everything a prophet would speak you know as a prophet like at general conference there um is the mind and the will of god there wouldn't be there couldn't be anything wrong with it everything in scripture is 100 the word of god kind of god breathed like protestants yep i think i call, them, I call them i call them mormon calvinists yeah that i probably and i don't think i'm unique that was sort of the mormonism that i grew up with and then whenever i learned you know for the first time that you know Brigham Young taught false doctrine, or there's maybe things in the scriptures that, you know, are contradictory. And that was really hard for me to, to reconcile because when you have black and white thinking, you think, well, if there's 1% or 2% that's wrong, then it's not all true. And you just throw it out. Yep. And, and, and here's the thing is that I, I began to realize something as I had my conversations with the Calvinists they have an absolute obsession with the need for an infallible source of truth. Yes. Yeah. It doesn't exist. Yeah. We don't believe in infallible sources of truth. Even our own Book of Mormon says, look, if there are mistakes, these are the mistakes of men, right? That's we true. look for reliable sources of truth, but not infallible sources of truth. But the thing is, is yeah. that it creates, it creates conflict. Because if there's any infallibility in there, then there's a lot of question. Well, is this one of those infallible? Is this one of those fallibilities manifesting itself? And Harrison, in this, and I'll continue to read here, he says, and um, his big point, his issue was, he says, um, it is in accepting the infallibility of the guidance of the church without any exceptions. That was his big problem that he had, him and yeah. God be, and, and them, right? Um, and it was really interesting to see how Brigham and the other church leaders responded because they didn't respond with, well, we're infallible. You just need to shut up and listen because you know the truth comes through us. In fact, Brigham very explicitly tells them, I'm not infallible. I'm a fallible man. But he said, the priesthood that I hold is infallible. Now I want to pause for a minute with what he's saying there. Okay. The priesthood, as I understand it, is an order. It's yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a structure within we operate. And what he was pointing out, he did the exact same thing that Elder Corbett talked about. It was really interesting to see they, they gave the same answer. They said, look, at some point, you undermine the, 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 the by pointing to the fallibility constantly, you undermine the structure that exists. And in the long game, in the long run, think about the Catholics. The structure is what holds us together. Yeah. I, it's, it's actually funny. I would say the last day of my mission, I wrote down in my journal what I learned from my mission. I, like there was, I, I wanted that kind of like sum it up. And it was weird. The lesson that I learned on my mission was not the lesson I expected to learn. I expected some like deep thing about loving the people. And I did, and I had all that. But <laughs> I came to understand Early, so early in my mission, everyone knows mission rules can be a little bit oppressive sometimes. And I was in Argentina. In Argentina, soccer is a big thing. Oh, yeah. And after my first transfer, a missionary had broke his leg playing soccer, and they banned us from playing soccer. I didn't play soccer the two years that I was in Argentina. Okay? And that was like, I was looking forward to getting good at soccer and all this stuff. And, like, and, and, and it was a rule that I didn't like. And there were other rules I didn't like. And I remember the first half of my mission, I spent a lot of time kind of, you know, I was never a, I was never a disobedient, bad missionary, but it always like, it was like a thorn in my side. And yeah. I don't know what happened. I, I had some, a lot of experience I can't go into, but something happened where I said, Jacob, it doesn't matter. It's not your call to make. Can you accept that even if this is the wrong call, 
that it's not yours to make. In other words, can I sustain the hierarchical structure still, even though you don't think they're doing it all right? Because the structure itself matters. And we as sort of modern liberal, meaning like classical liberally minded people are very, that from those are from Protestant roots, by the way, historically speaking, we come from that no, like stick it to the authority, power to the people. Yeah, whistleblowers. Exactly. Call them the marks. Yeah, hold them a carnival. And, but if you think about it, um, if, if you think about it, that Elder Corbett or Brother Corbett talked about that there are channels for this. It is not that the church, you you can't have concerns, you can't voice those concerns. It's the way you go about doing it. If if you contact your priesthood leaders, if you have those kind of conversations, if you do that, like there are ways to do it, but it's not to, but but at some point, and I don't know exactly where this line is, right? This is this is maybe where the, the hard part of it is, is to figure out, well, where is that line between, you know, counseling together about things that you don't think are right and tearing down faith in the authority structure of the church itself and actually harming the mission of the church. Right. Yeah. Um, and Brigham, it's interesting what he said. He said, and now Brigham said, what would happen if every person goes his or her own way? He was talking to this about these people. He said, what confusion, what discord, what disconnect, what hatred would soon creep into the bosom of individuals one against another. And I was thinking, Man, that's like exactly what we have today. We have immense divisions because we all kind of, we break away from the unifying structure of priesthood authority and you end up with, you know, I, again, I point to Protestantism. That's what happened. They rejected the authority structure that held them together as a church and people. And you being in Ireland know very well that that can make horrible messes within the ecclesiastical structure of the church. And yeah. Brigham said, are we the church and kingdom of God, the family of heaven? Yes. Um, have we been made, or we have made no bargain. Uh, uh, we, uh, yes, we have made no bargain to gather up Zion. Uh, what did, I'm sorry, I'm reading this wrong. We okay. have made no bargain to gather up to Zion to raise confusion. In other words, we're not bringing people together to raise confusion. There's a, like, my whole thing with the whole, okay, well, the prophet's infallible, you know, do you sustain him? You don't have to agree with the prophet. There even are channels for you to talk about your concerns with your own leaders, and maybe they won't do anything. And fine, that's their prerogative. You don't then go, well, if you guys aren't going to do what I want, I'm going to seek to go around you to agitate and engage in activism against the church to try and create the change that I want. That, in my mind, is where you cross over that line into apostasy because at that point, you're actually challenging the very structure itself as oppressive and as wrong. And when you do that, you're challenging the church. The church is the structure. 